Jeez. Tell me when. All right, there we go. <clears throat> Good morning. At least it is here in Alaska. I guess you guys are at noontime central and Dr. Lee is much further along. My name is Mary Owen, Dr. Mary Owen. I'm the director of the Center of American Indian and Minority Health at the University of Minnesota Medical School. I um, would like to mel welcome you today for uh, to join us on our kickoff for a seminar series on um, topics that affect Native American health. The center is a program within the University of Minnesota that's been around for about 45 years, now dedicated to improving Native health through um, raising Native physicians, but also through programs like this that educate uh, um, the public about issues in Native health. And you might wonder, well, what does land-grant universities have to do with Native health? Well, um, for lots of different reasons, but probably the most e uh, easy one to think about, as I just meant, uh, discussed with our panelists today, is that um, Native people were forced onto non-usable um, lands. And as such, there was little economy and there remains little economy on those lands. And um, most of us recognize the combinate or the um, potential of uh, low economy to contribute to poor health outcomes or poor economy to contribute to poor health outcomes. So, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and start with um, introductions of the of your different speakers today. First, we have Mr. Robert Lee or Dr. Robert Lee. He's a lecturer in American history and a fellow of Selwyn College at the University of Cambridge. His research draws on geographic information systems mapping to explore the interconnectedness of histories and indigenous disposition and US state formation and has appeared in the Journal of American History, uh, High Country News and the New York, or, um, in the New York Times. He is a uh, PhD, he is earning his PhD in history from the University of California, Berkeley. He was a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Mr. Tad Johnson, our uh, Professor Tad Johnson. Tad was named the U of M's first senior director of American Indian Tribal Re um, Nations Relations. In this role, he is housed at the University of Minnesota Duluth, where he's also director of the Tribal Sovereignty Institute and director of graduate studies in the American Indian Studies Department. In addition to his academic work, Johnson is a resource to tribal government and Native American people and, more, and has more than three decades of leadership and service in the field of federal Indian law and policy. He served as a tribal attorney for more than 20 years as a tribal court judge and administrator and is a frequent lecturer on American Indian history and federal Indian law. He spent five years with the U.S. House of Representatives, ultimately becoming a staff director and counsel to the subcommittee of Native, of Native American Affairs, on Native American Affairs, pardon me. In 1997, President Clinton appointed Johnson to chair the National Indian Gaming Commission. He is nationally recognized in the area of Native American law and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. And finally, last but not least, we have Mr. Doug Thompson or Professor Doug Thompson. He's an assistant professor in the American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota Duluth. He teaches federal Indian law, tribal administration and governance and tribal resources and environmental stewardship. Prior to joining UMD, he worked as a tribal relations specialist for the Chippewa National Forest. As a private, <clears throat> private sector attorney and as a program director for the Nature Conservancy, Doug has spent over 20 years representing tribal and non-tribal interests on land restoration and conservation projects throughout North America. And he is a member of the Lumbee Nation or is he is Lumbee. I wanna thank all of our panelists. I want to remind you all that this is being recorded. We will take your questions in the chat or in the questions section on Q and A and try our best to an answer as many as possible. We're gonna go until about quarter tell so that we, we can answer at the latest till quarter tell so that we can answer as many questions as possible. We recognize people will have to drop off at uh, 10 o'clock and I think I squeezed everything in I needed to so that we can go on with our talk. I want, would ask people to um, apologize in advance for any weird noises. From my end, I am staying with my folks and can't control noises outside of myself. So Dr. Lee, can you take it away? Yeah, thank you. Um, let me just get the, the screen sharing going here. Um, All right. Okay, does everybody uh, everybody see it there? Okay, so title slide here. Well, 
First of all, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about uh, this story, uh, Land Grab Universities. It's always a um, a real honor and a pleasure to be able to talk about the um, to talk about the work that went into this piece and the larger project uh, around it. Um, and this is the first time I'm getting to speak about it at a uh, a medical school or in connection with medical school. So uh, this is the first for me, and very very exciting. I'm very grateful uh, for the opportunity. Um, now, the Land Grab University project was about taking apart, in a very concrete sense, the myth of uh, that America's land grant universities owed their start to a free gift of land. Behind that myth lies a massive resource transfer, a wealth transfer that's been dressed up as a donation. Um, the Moral Act of 1862, which is the law at the center of this project, um, is responsible for creating a nationwide uh, land grant university system in the United States. Um, and it worked by turning land expropriated from tribal nations into seed money for higher education. Um, and all the acts signed by Abraham Lincoln redistributed nearly 11 million acres. That's an area about the size of Denmark. Um, but with a footprint that was broken up into roughly 80,000 parcels of land scattered across 24 mostly Western states, its place in the violent history of North American colonization has remained really inaccessible and out of view. At root, really, the goal of the collaboration out of High Country News that published the project, uh, which includes an article, a website, and an open source data set, um, was to make the connections between indigenous land loss and the material prosperity of land grant universities accessible. Um, to do that, over the past two years, High Country News went about locating more than 99% of all Moral Act acres. We identified their original indigenous inhabitants and caretakers and researched the principle raised from their sale in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. We reconstructed approximately 10.7 million acres taken from nearly 250 tribes, bands, and communities through more than 160 violence-backed land sessions. This land was used to raise over $20 million in endowment principle, uh, which in today's dollars would be worth about a half a billion dollars for what it was at the time, these really fledgling tiny colleges. Um, in many instances, these funds help these universities, universities like the University of Minnesota, become what they are today. Um, so let me see if I can switch this slide here. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk a bit about the background of the project, um, I'll provide some additional detail in the Moral Act of 1862 and our approach um, that went into producing the main article, um, which you're seeing the cover page from here. Then I'll talk about the other materials produced by the project and, so, and a couple of the responses, but I think we're going to hear more about that uh, from some of the other panelists. So the indigenous sources of university land has been a major emerging issue in only about the last five years or so. Um, and really the springboard for it was what I'm sure many of you seen, have seen in the news, um, work on slavery in the university, thinking about how, um, how universities' ties to the transatlantic slave trade helped capitalize universities in the United States and around the world. Um, now, people interested in um, the history of indigenous North America uh, really only started talking about this in the past few years. It was in 2014 that Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz published an indigenous people's history of the United States, which flagged this issue about land grant universities. There have been cultural theorists like Kay Wayne Yang who've written about it. More recently, there have been articles by scholars like Sharon Stein and Margaret Nash who have framed the Morrill Act of 1862 as settler colonial legislation. Um, that took from indigenous nations to expand agricultural and mechanical education for, for settlers. Um, meanwhile, there's been some research projects um, trying to look at the Moral Act footprint in Indian country of universities like UMass and Virginia Tech, but those projects uh, ran into some problems and sort of amassing the material needed to really make that visible. And there's also been some, some attempts by universities like Iowa State, Michigan State, University of Nebraska to map their land grant footprint, 
but without any uh, sense or interest really uh, in the indigenous origins of the land that helped fund their operations. Um, now down at, at SMU, there's an, an, there's an anthology in the works on campus and colonialism um, that I think is gonna push things forward. And all of this is just to say um, that it's really, I think an important, uh, it's an important time, uh, possibly a tipping point and it's an exciting time to be thinking about what was until recently a really entirely neglected issue in the scholarship and the public memory of land grant universities. Now, where did the High Country News collaboration come in? Um, we started work in 2018 when uh, Tristan Atone, my co-author on the piece and I, we were both on fellowships uh, at Harvard. Um, and it was lucky that we sort of ran into each other there because I'm a historian, uh, he's a journalist, and I gave a presentation about the sort of difficulty of, uh, of, um, of identifying Moral Act, Moral Act acres. Uh, and we got to talking about how we could sort of bring this to a wider audience and the collaboration that produced land grab universities uh, was, was the result. Um, now the object of, uh, of our project uh, was to not just look at uh, the parcels that benefited a single university or were located in a single state, but to try and unspool the entire knot of the Morrill Act, um, to identify every acre insofar it was as possible, identify its indigenous origins of, of each one of these parcels, and to gain a sense of the enormity of the wealth transfer that the Morrill Act entailed, because that's really the intervention that's at the heart of this piece, understanding uh, the, the distribution of land by the federal government of the United States as a, as a resource transfer, not a series of, not a series of gifts. Um, and the map that you're looking at here, you've been looking at for the past couple of minutes is, is the results of the investigation in its most condensed form, right? These approximately 80,000 parcels, roughly 99% of the Morrill Act land. It shows the location of all of the parcels we identified spread across uh, these 24 states um, and links the university beneficiary uh, to the indigenous land session for which the United States claim the land. The parcels describe 10.7 million acres uh, distributed for the benefit of 47 states, which sold the rights to select the land. They sold the land itself um, uh, through their own real estate operations, or they otherwise mortgaged or leased the land and funneled the proceeds into endowments for 52 universities. Most states I, um, allocated, the, allocated the grant to one university. Uh, a couple did, did it to two, places like Massachusetts, Kentucky, Mississippi, South Carolina. Um, most of these universities were public, like the University of Minnesota. Um, some were private, like Cornell, like MIT. The land these universities benefited from came from, uh, as I mentioned earlier, roughly 250 different tribes and nations whose land was claimed through 162 uh, different treaties, ratified, unratified, and other forms of land taking, things like congressional acts. And when you look at how much was paid, and it's important to note, uh, uh, First, that for many of the many of this uh, the parcels here, much of the the land sessions that you see, nothing was paid at all. But when you look across the board, um, the United States paid roughly four hundred thousand uh, dollars to extinguish Indian title to the land that was ultimately redistributed through the Morrill Act, and they raised in principle uh, about twenty three million dollars. That's a ratio of fifty seven to one. So for every dollar that is paid. Uh, to indigenous nations for their title, $57 in principle is funneled into the coffers of land grant universities. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in contemporary dollars, we're talking about principle, it was worth about a half a billion dollars in today's dollars. Um, and that is before the money is put to work raising interest, which is what the land grant universities can use to fund their operation. So how did this happen? What was the Morrill Act? How did it work? Uh, these maps and infographics were created by Margaret Pierce, who was a cartographer on the project, um, and it can help answer those questions. Uh, let me just give you a, a quick sketch of the Morrill Act itself as a law. Um, LGUs, land grant universities, they didn't begin with the Morrill Act of 1862. They began much earlier. The earliest federal land grant for a college that I've been able to find was for Jefferson College in, in Mississippi in 1803, which went defunct in the 20th century. It was a high school. Um, by the mid 19th century, 
You had the formation of state universities, some of which I'm sure you know, Michigan State, Penn State um, University, which were promoting programs of agricultural and mechanical education, so A&M colleges, right? Um, these became the models for the national LGU system that was ushered in by the Morrill Act of 1862. The federal law um, was, was taking the state model and expanding it, nationalizing it, seeking to extend higher education to the, to the children of you know, toiling farmers and the industrial classes. Um, it was this mission of expanding higher education, making it more practi practical and applicable to the problems of sort of engineering prosperity that led land-grant universities to be referred to as democracies colleges. You'll see this all over the literature, often with a question mark after it. A lot of the writing about land-grant universities uh, from a historian's perspective uh, concerns how well they realized uh, the ambitions of opening up education to the masses. Um, and you see this in a lot of the mythologizing that goes on around land-grant universities. Um, the law itself was one of those sort of big three land laws of 1862. Uh, that was the Homestead Act in that year, which gave land to farmers who would work it for five years. Then came the Pacific Railroad Act, which created these checkerboard sized grants to fund the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, then came the Morrill Act, which granted states land expropriated from indigenous nations to fund endowments for colleges. Now, all of the land redistributed by the United States was expropriated from indigenous people. Um, that's something that I'm sure everyone uh, that's here today knows, and I imagine most Americans know it too, at least in some sort of crude or abstract sense. Um, the problem is that the sort of unfathomable, unfathomable scope of uh, this colonial takeover of indigenous North America can be easy to sort of be left in the, in the abstract. Um, how do you get to the details? That is, um, that's the problem here. And one way to get at it um, is to look at how something like Memorial Act worked. Um, the sort of step-by-step -step guide you see goes through the sort of nuts and bolts. First, what's gonna happen is Congress is gonna offer land grants, state legislatures are gonna agree to participate. Some of this land has already been acquired from, uh, from indigenous nations through various treaties and, and other, and other uh, sort of strong armed agreements. Um, other places are gonna be acquired down the road. Um, the grants themselves are gonna come in a range of sizes from 90,000 acres to 990,000 acres. And those sizes are gonna depend on the congressional delegation size of a state. So New York is the largest state in the 1860 census. It gets nearly a million acres, the largest, the largest grant. And step four here shows you the sort of two major ways in which the land itself was distributed. How it worked with sort of Western states where there was a lot of unsold public domain land. Um, they, these were the so-called land states like California that you see on the left here. Um, they had to select land from within their boundaries. So that's why you see all of California's land within its state boundaries. Eastern and Midwestern states, which had little or no public domain land, got strip to select parcels out West. Now, scrip was like coupons, basically, for, for the selection of uh, surveyed public domain land. Um, and then finally, these grants are disposed of. Um, most of the eastern sort of scrip states sold the scrip in blocks to speculators to raise endowments quickly. Western states tended to select and sell the land more slowly. Um, the proceeds in both instances become the Morrill Act endowments, which had to be held in perpetuity. Uh, with the interest used to support the university operations. By the 20th century, uh, the principal in these funds was worth the sort of $23 million that I mentioned earlier, or the roughly uh, half a billion dollars today. Um, by tracking down each one of these parcels, we were able to generate the descriptive statistics that you see here in red and much more for every land grant university, things like the number of parcels, what type it was, how much land it involved, how many treaties uh, and agreements were, were, were involved, what was the endowment, uh, what was the endowment raised. Um, and this can get really granular. This infographic shows one 640 acre parcel, it's a square mile in downtown Tucson, Arizona, seized from the Western Apache in the 1880s and redistributed to fund the University of Arizona. In the middle is the parcel sort of zoomed in uh, under a satellite view. And you can see sort of a bit, if you look close, you can see a baseball field, you can see tracked housing. Um, and on the ground level, this sort of call out dot here um, is one of the photos of the track taken by Kaylin Goodluck, who was the photographer for the project. 
Um, and you can see really what's, what, what's on the ground here, this place, the Apache Tears Motel, that evokes some of the history uh, of the area in this, sort of, uh, in this sort of kitschy way, but remains completely unmoored from the stories that we tell about the development of a school like the University of Arizona. What the article does is rebuild a number of those connections, uh, but we couldn't cover all of them. So we built landgrabu.org, the website, to allow readers uh, to explore the data themselves. So here's the main page for the site, which lets users reconstruct ties between indigenous dispossession and land grant university funding in a, in a dynamic, in a dynamic way. If in the story you're getting a sort of a, a curated take on the history of, uh, of the Morrill Act and land grant universities, on the website you can choose your own adventure and explore uh, and explore all of the connections that we were able to find. Um, in the data. I'll just show you a short uh, video tour here. Um, what you see here is uh, Cornell's university page with the various call out statistics that we, that we found. You can go down to the map uh, where we've literally connected the university sites to every parcel uh, that they were linked to using a tool in GIS built to generate flight paths. Um, now you can see those flight paths between Cornell's roughly 6,000 parcels spread out over more than a dozen states. Here we are sort of zooming in uh, on Wisconsin. You can, you can fly through and you can see uh, how, you can, how you can touch down on these places. Um, the accuracy of this material, um, it's, I, you can put it into your GPS and you can drive to these parcels for the most part. Um, and you can you can visit them and you can see what is there, which is how we had Kaylin go and take photographs of, of a bunch of these places. Here we are in California going through the Great Valley uh, in California. I think we're going to pass Oakdale up on the right here, which is uh, the, the, the self-proclaimed cowboy capital of the world. Um, and you can see these, uh, these parcels connected to, in this case, uh, Cornell's grant. Um, we're moving up the coast. There's San Francisco Bay uh, going up to uh, around around Seattle, and I think we'll zoom in. Uh, we'll zoom in on Seattle, and what we're seeing is um, journalists using this website uh, for all sorts of things uh, to look at the data, but to also try to understand how they can write their own land acknowledgments using um, using this type of material. Um, yeah, this is downtown Seattle. These are all over the place. Um, Okay, um, so how about Minnesota? If you look on the website, you can, uh, you can find Minnesota's uh, page and you can zoom in. This is what it looks like. Uh, Minnesota was a land state, so it selected parcels um, within the state boundaries and it sold them over several decades. Um, and here's what it looks like when you turn on the indigenous, uh, the indigenous sessions layer. Um, the GIS tools powering, the, powering this analysis are pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, the tool is a spatial join. Um, that enables you to recreate the paths from the, from the nations to the universities um, and enable us in the case of Minnesota to say for the first time that 98% of its grant was selected from within the Dakota land strong armed in the U U.S. possession through the Dakota treaties of 1851. We also found that no other indigenous, uh, indigenous session provided uh, land to more universities uh, in this session of 1851, nearly 830,000 acres from this one treaty area, um, that's an area about three times the size of LA, uh, went to 35 land grant universities. It furnished one out of every 13 acres that were redistributed under the Morrill Act. So using these tools, uh, you could tell stories uh, that you just couldn't see before. Um, and that was the reason why we highlighted uh, the Minnesota experience in the story. Um, taking two stories, on the one hand, uh, the history of the session of 1851, the subsequent Dakota uprising, uh, and the financial security gained by the University of Minnesota through the Morrill Act uh, in the 1860s. Um, and we told these stories together uh, because they were, they were intertwined. Um, about a month after the largest mass hanging in US history, when 38 Dakotas were murdered for their participation in the uprising against the conditions created by the Treaty of 1851, uh, the governor of Minnesota at the time, Alexander Ramsey, he signs a state up for its Morrill Act windfall, uh, which would pull land from that treaty into the coffers of the university. 
Um, here's a sort of call out page for the University of Minnesota on landgrabu.org. Um, you can see some of the, the, the sort of key stats here. This is University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, today over 50,000 students, um, 160 identified as American Indian or Alaskan Native. Um, the school was founded in 1851, but it closes in the 1860s and it's sort of brought back to life through this, this windfall created by the Morrill Act. 94,000 acres, which raised over a half a million dollars by the early 20th century. The ratio of expenditures here was 250 to one, right? For every $1 uh, spent on title by the United States, $250 go uh, into the coffers of the University of Minnesota. Um, you know, the University of Minnesota was featured in the story, but many weren't, and you can explore them on the site, right? I mean, here is South Carolina, uh, really zoomed out um, here, zoomed in on uh, on another spot in 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 Seattle, and you can see some of the call out data that you can pull there. Um, and there are pages for every single one of these eighty thousand parcels on the website. This is the the information associated with the parcel that we were just looking at. Um, and here is Kaylin's photo of the Fort Lawton uh, Cemetery in Seattle. Um, so you can see what's on the ground. And really in the story, um, if you get a chance to read it, uh, there aren't a lot of human characters. Really the main protagonist is the, is the land itself. So it was really important for us to bring, bring us sort of down to the ground and see what was at these places. Um, this is an, a neighborhood at night uh, in, 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 in LA. Um, grabbed by the U.S. in an unratified treaty signed by nine different Californian tribes in 1851. Nothing was paid for it. Uh, the 160-acre parcel raises about nearly $800 for the University of California. Um, here's the image from the cover of the story. Um, cornfields in Adams, Nebraska, homelands of the Kaw Nation, sold for the benefit of Ohio State University. Um, here's a scrapyard in El Rosa, Minnesota acquired by the US through the Dakota Treaty of 1851, the one I was talking about earlier, sold for the benefit of the University of Minnesota. Part of the mythology around the Morrill Act is that, uh, is that it was all for the benefit, <clears throat> excuse me, of a higher purpose, a sort of a noble, a noble cause, land turned into prosperity. Well, here's what we don't usually see, right? The land being disrespected, literally sort of a trash pile. Um, now the website is sort of the second level of the story in which you can explore the material on your own. But if you really wanna dig in and push the research forward, you can go to the data for the site. It was very important for us to make all of this open source um, so, uh, so that people could, people could use it, uh, could do additional research, move it forward. There is a user guide there uh, for all of the data, uh, the shape files and also the tabular data. Um, it's really easy to use. Um, if you're not in the GIS, most of the material is, uh, it's in tabular format. You can open it in Excel um, and you can explore it yourself. You can explore it with your classes um, if, if you have it. I don't usually get to talk about more of the sources behind it, um, but I wanted to today uh, because Minnesota was a little bit more interesting than a lot of, uh, than a lot of the, um, the, uh, the, the research a lot of the research was done in BLM sources that could be, we could use, uh, we could use um, uh, digital tools for, for, for sort of uh, ripping, ripping, uh, ripping data from the BLM. Um, and it was more about digital manipulation. Uh, there were a lot of states where we had to find, you know, go into the archive and find the material, um, find the material sort of on the ground. This is from Minnesota Historical Society. This is what these parcels look like on the selection list. That you see there on the right on the bottom you see appraisals um you see appraisals from the 1860s now remember this is all land that the united states paid about two cents for this is you know uh 10 years 15 years later um when uh the land prices have not risen but you see them appraise the same land for five dollars an acre ten dollars an acre right um and if you go further uh, you'll see, see all the sources in the GitHub download. Um, this is one that supported a line in the story about Minnesota finishing its land sales by 1904. You can see how granular this can get. We collected a tremendous amount of material, but there is a lot, lot more, uh, a lot, lot more to be found. Um, since we published the story, there has been some, uh, some response. 
Uh, this is this is Forbes and the Chronicle of Higher Education are responding to some of the issues that we looked at. There have been some people who have looked at the data uh, and done great and creative things with it. This is from Fox. Um, Fox was looking at the data to build a timeline about Missouri's grant um, and its connection to the Osage people. Uh, here's a map that was made by I on Ohio uh, to look at Ohio State's Moral Act footprint. Um, some have taken the research even further. This is a Scallywag uh, piece about UNC that appeared a couple of months ago, and it combined our findings uh, with their own uh, look into different grants at UNC uh, profiteering off of indigenous land to really uh, to really expand uh, to expand the research, and that's really the hope here. Um, this is a policy paper uh, by Megan Redshirt Shaw. Uh, it's, a, it's a brief that argues that land-grant universities have an obligation to either return land or to provide free tuition uh, for, for Indigenous students. We've seen a number of, of student petitions. On the left is an early one out of the University of Florida. Um, this one on the right, I just saw it this weekend uh, out of Cornell University, where the Student Assembly is, is, uh, is asking the university to reckon uh, with, its history, uh, with its history of the Moral Act. Uh, Cornell University, the American Indian and Indigenous Studies Program, has launched a uh, has launched a, a, a project to look into the university's relationship to the to the Moral Act. Um, so there's been some some exciting developments about sort of thinking about where this research could go from here. And some of it came from our own research. Um, one of the one of the more interesting things that we found in the process of reporting on the story was that more than a half a million acres originally distributed to the Morrill Act was never sold. It was still, it's still held by the states for the benefit of universities. Um, this is a summary of some of that data. In fiscal year 2019, it generated uh, over $8 million for land grant universities, um, in mostly, mostly in the West. Um, so the point here is that we're continuing this sort of research uh, and uh, there's a tremendous amount that we still don't know about the history of the Morrill Act, the history of, of land grants for universities um, in general. And the goal of the story was not to provide sort of a final word, but really to, find, to provide a springboard uh, into doing uh, additional research along these lines. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop for there because I think I'm going on long enough uh, and I want to give everyone else a chance to talk and uh, us to have questions. Thank you, Mr. Lee. That was uh, fantastic and a, um, a nice summary of an amazing article that you did in High Country News, Miigwech. Um, I would like to turn next to um, Ms. Our, our Professor Thompson. I think you have some thoughts that you wanted to emphasize on Minnesota's um, part in all of this. And then from there, we will go to um, Professor Johnson and discuss um, what he has seen from Tribal Nation's responses and other people's responses that weren't mentioned by Mr. Lee. So go ahead, Mr. Thompson. Okay, thanks, Barry. That's okay. Um, yeah, just to emphasize, you know, th this crowd is either we're studying, we're working, teaching here in northern Minnesota. Um, and 1860, early 1860s is kind of on the front end of um, what would become the assimilation era. And that is the people are familiar with the boarding school era. There was another part of that called um, allotments. And allotments allowed settlement within the reservations in addition to these land sales that were happening off res. And the way it worked is an individual or family would get 40 to 160 acres. And instead of the reservation being held, you know, communally and managed communally, um, trying to encourage individual land ownership. And so whenever all the lands were allotted, because you only have so many tribal citizens, the rest of the lands within the reservation were called surplus. And then those will be open for settlement. The name of this act here in Minnesota is, was the Nelson Act. It passed in 1889, named after Knut Nelson. And Knut was a senator who was closely tied to the, to the timber industry, the timber barons. And what Knut did was he got his patrons, his constituents, the timber folks, the ability to go into the reservations and to begin to gobble up, gobble up those lands and take them away what was happening in northern Minnesota and northern Wisconsin at the time too, was the states were starting to realize the value of tourism and were beginning to illegally um, assert jurisdiction over tribal members 
in the ceded territories outside of the reservations where the rights to hunt, fish, and gather are legally a retained right. And you overlay this with the boarding school era. During the boarding school um, era in the late 1800s and going into the 1900s, you know, splitting up families, um, kids were not allowed to worship. They weren't allowed to speak their language. Their physical appearance was changed by dress, cutting of hair, et cetera. If you look at um, current uh, international law, it's a violation of human rights. It is a textbook of ethnocide. So you have this amplification of all of these terrible things happening at the same time. And, um, and it, it, learning about uh, the work that Professor Lee has done here just gives you a sense for how horrible things were and it gives a connection to the universities. So I just wanted to give that little bit of the local history. I think Tad has some things to add, but I wanted to make sure people on this call or on this Zoom in this meeting understand what was happening here at, at the time that um, the era that Robert was doing his research. So that's what I have, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I think it's so important for us to try to connect what the sen sentiment might have been at that time with all these uh, um, ideas that we talk about so easily and freely, you know, just the, how people might have actually been um, experiencing what we're talking about. So thank you for that. Uh, I will turn over to Tad. Uh, Professor Johnson, can you give us an idea of what you've seen as far as tribal leaders responding to this or your thoughts at all on how this is, um, this information is being received, has been received. Thanks, Dr. Owen. And Dr. Lee, I was just going to request if you could put that one map of Minnesota up with sort of the purple rain uh, of uh, land ownership coming out of it. Um, the uh, tribes of Minnesota got a hold of, of your article, especially the one on the, uh, that's the one, uh, the one on the, uh, uh, the Minnesota windfall. And um, several of us sent it to the president of the University of Minnesota. Um, and we did it um, because for many years, several of us has said, and both when I was a tribal attorney and later a professor, that um, we see consultation going on between the United States and tribes and now uh, with the advent of Governor Dayton and Governor Walls, we see consultation going on between uh, the state of Minnesota and the tribes. But some of us were saying, why is there no consultation between the university and the tribes? And I said, we have government to government relations between the federal government and the tribes and the state government and the tribes. Why no type of consultation? And they said, well, Tad, we're not a government. We're a... Um, um, and I said, but you're a land grant university. Um, and the basis of the trust responsibility with tribes is um, there was a quid pro quo. The United States got land, but the tribes got services from the US into perpetuity based on a promise. Here, the University of Minnesota got land, but the tribes got pretty much nothing back. Um, and so, um, they are now walking the path a little more of, of going down the road of consulting with tribes on a regular basis. So when the tribes got a hold of this article, um, they did uh, three resolutions from the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, all the tribes in Minnesota except Upper Sioux. One had to do with um, keeping the, um, uh, uh, the uh, American Indian um, Resource Learning Resources Center open at UMD. Um, one had to do with um, the Native American Graves Protection Act, where the University of Minnesota had gone down and uh, taken 186 bodies and uh, about $150 million worth of funerary objects, and is still in possession as in non-compliance with the uh, Native American Graves Protection Act, which the tribes uh, knew about, but did finally did a resolution on after being inspired by your article. And last, there were a whole bunch of other things they wanted from the University of Minnesota that after looking at your work decided, hey, we should in Michigan tribes get uh, you know, some free tuition deal. Uh, now granted the University of Minnesota Morris, uh, which was an Indian boarding school, there is a uh, tuition plan there for Native American students. 
but they were like, why don't we get that for all of our students? You know, uh, if you look at the tremendous largesse that the state of Minnesota and the University of Minnesota obtained from the just the Dakota people, and then actually that map of the 1837 uh, treaty, that is a big swath that cuts through part of Northern Minnesota and most of Northern Wisconsin. And for mostly during the 1980s and 1990s, the Chippewas were fighting over the right to hunt, fish, and gather there. And that, you know, the racism that we found in Minnesota and Northern Wisconsin was just a little below the surface. And they had to fight all the way to the Supreme Court to get their rights back to hunt and fish and gather in an 1837 territory. But that, in looking at your slide of that, can you move to that? That one, was that the biggest piece that was taken uh, among the larger um, uh, uh, land takings of the, of the 19th century? It appeared to be so. Um, but so it's no. ironic that all that, go ahead, Robert. I'd, I'd have to double check it's the largest. Can you hear me? Well, anyway, uh, the 1837 tr tribes had to fight for their hunt, right to hunt, fish, and gather, and that. And now, um, uh, you know, we have to pay tuition at the University of Wisconsin, University of Minnesota, et cetera. Um, but I think, you know, what the tribes of Minnesota said, among other things, was. Um, there is a, an endowed chair at the University of Minnesota Law School that was endowed by somebody who engaged in, in federal Indian law for years in the Indian Claims Commission. The chair has been there for 40 years. It's never been used to teach federal Indian law. Um, they talked about the fact that, you know, um, uh, scholarships for tribal people have been cut back. Um, uh, they talked about, you know, maybe working together, the University of Minnesota and the legislature on getting some package together where American Indians could attend any public university for free. So anyway, this, this article sparked a great deal of, of thinking on the part of tribes um, and thinking of um, the two um, major sins of American history, which number one, the enslavement of African people Number two, the taking of land from Indians. And I think we're still grappling with those two problems. But now that you've done this work, um, the regents of the University of Minnesota that technically own the property can see how they got the property. And um, uh, I know the president's read the article. I know there's at least one regent watching. So I th hopefully this leaves us with some ideas about where tribes go next. And I think that'll have to do with working with the university, working with the state legislature, possibly Congress, on um, on looking at what is what 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 is truth and reconciliation in this as a result of these facts. So, Chimi Gwetch, for your work. Yes, Chimi Gwetch, and thank you, Doctor, our professors Johnson, Thompson, and Lee. Um, Tad, I will push back with you and say that besides taking the land, I'd say the other injustice was genocide to Native peoples. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, such an amazing and important talk, but we do have some, and we do have some questions lined up, so we're going to go ahead and get to them. I did see someone's hand raised, but Kirsten, I can't get to those, so if you can help me with that. I'll start off with a couple of questions that we have. Um, a lot of people are wondering about, first of all, just some basics on the addresses uh, to the sites, the amazing site. Some people have been able to access it already and others haven't. So we will include that on our website as well as this recording. So have no fear there. Um, <clears throat> a lot, uh, several people have asked about who is educating the funders and how are the trustees of the HBCUs as well as all these other colleges um, address, addressing um, uh, this information um, as we move forward or since the um, publication of your article. And you mentioned a little bit of that. I don't know if you have anything else that you want to mention on that point, Dr. Lee, Mr. Lee, Professor Lee. Um, yeah, uh, I'll just, I'll first say, uh, I don't have access to everyone in the chat. I tried to type the um, the address in there. Oh, it looks like uh, Kirsten has has put it up there, landgrabu.org. Yeah, this is where you can explore it for yourself. And there's links to um, the downloadable data. Um, 
yeah, the response to the, the piece in terms of um, moving forward education on this issue um, has really been from the ground up. Uh, I don't know if you noticed on, on one of those on the slides there where we have the statistics for all of the universities as part of the reporting structure. I mean, I'm not, I, I learned this, uh, I'm a historian, so it was sort of, it was outside my normal sort of purview, but my, uh, my partner is a journalist um, and he insisted that we inform all of the universities of the data that we had before we went to, before we went to press. Uh, to get to get comment and to make sure no one was no one was blindsided. Now, if you can imagine, uh, this went to press in on the end of March of this year. So the world was uh, turning upside down, especially in the United States. We didn't know if anyone would read it. We originally had all these partners who wanted to do co-reporting on it. We were doing trainings uh, with other journalists to uh, get them up feed on the data. Uh, they fell away sort of one by one as all of the coverage in the world went to uh, COVID uh, all the time. Um, but since the piece has come out, there's been sort of a, a, a slower um, uh, drawing in of attention around it. And the response and the sort of pushing the information uh, out to out to universities and other communities has really been from the ground up. It's by it's been by sort of students and faculty um, at, at universities in general, but also at, at land grant universities. Um, so it's been through talks like it's been through talks like this one, and it's been through uh, people exchanging the article on social media and places like like Twitter or Facebook. Um, it's been sort of from the from the ground up. Do you, um, Dr. Lee, were any tribal officials involved in your research? That's a question that we have. Uh, a member, uh, uh, several members of the um, of the research team, uh, or tribal tribal enrolled tribal members. Um, but in so the, the the project was done under the aegis of the the tribal affairs desk of High Country News. Uh, but it wasn't done in association with any tribal governments. Thank you. Kirsten, someone had their hand up and I can't see that person. So if you're able to remember that or ask them to put some, um, whoever that is to, it uh, looks like Mangan Golden has now raised her hand. Um, are we able to let Mangan's voice come through, Kirsten? I'm not sure that I see any hand raising, but I would encourage folks to try to use the chat or the Q&A functions. Can we um, allow Mangan to ask her question? Oh, Oops, she, she, she did that by accident. All right, thank you. Um, I, I'm struck by the, um, I've read this in history before, but the degree that land speculation was involved in the taking of our land, and you mentioned that a little bit. Um, Professor Lee, can you talk about that a little bit more? Did you find that was a, a large impetus even for this act? Or um, was it truly more of this um, want to democratize uh, education? Any thoughts on that? Well, the moment when in which this is passed is sort of the, the height of the the height of the Civil War. Um, and land markets are being flooded. Uh, flooded with, with land, not just through the Morrill Act, there are things like military bounty warrants. There are, in the 19th century or the long 19th century, there are more than 3,000 land laws that are involved with distributing uh, all manner of, of, of federal land. Um, so speculation is rampant. I mean, one of the, where speculation really figures in this story is, uh, is in the disposal of the of the grants. The way that the Morrill Act was structured was such that there was an incentive uh, for the states um, who held this scrip in trust for the universities um, to sell off the scrip as fast as possible because the universities could only live off the interest from uh, that was generated by the sales. Um, so in order to do that, they turned to speculators and they sold it in bulk. Uh, to, to speculators. These were sort of the Eastern script states. It was different in the Western states where they tended to hold on to the land for longer. And as a result, um, they received higher prices uh, and larger and larger windfalls. Um, but yeah, speculation is a big part of the story and it really intersects with it in the case of Cornell University, uh, which was able to really be the, um, 
uh, the greatest earner off of Morrill Act lands, not just because they got the most land, because they were the largest state, because they got this 990,000 acres, but also because uh, Ezra Cornell, who was the founder of the university, folded the land back into basically a speculative scheme where he was the, he was the speculator that they sold the script to. And then he resold it on the, on the open market and folded those funds back into the university. Uh, so they got to get a sort of a, a double windfall uh, from, from the Morrill Act. And you could see the, um, the effects of that were sort of enormous to be able to take advantage of that. Cornell was founded circa 1865 to take advantage of the Morrill Act. Um, by the mid 1880s, it's the third wealthiest university in the United States. There are hundreds of colleges and universities at the time, uh, but it's this, uh, it's the Morrill Act that allows this sort of meteoric rise uh, and speculation in particular. You mentioned a university team was working on a campus and colonialism anthology. Which university was that? Um, this is being uh, published out of uh, Southern Methodist University. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah, it's, a, it's in the works as far as I understand it. There's, there's, I think there's a lot of emerging work on this. I'll also say that there's, a, there's been a round table um, with, uh, with um, uh, NASA, the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association Journal. Um, where they got, uh, I think, 12 different uh, scholars from different fields to sort of weigh in on the land grab university piece and think about what it means going forward. That should be out, I think, later this year or sometime early, early next year. So there's really, I mean, not to, not to you know, use a pun, there's sort of a groundswell uh, in, in doing this type of, of research. And I think it's going to uh, expand outward from here. Um, one of the really surprising things, I think, about uh, this work, you know, we, we, we talk about the project, it's 11 million acres, this is a tremendous amount uh, of land, um, and we collected information on the principal raised, but there is so much more to discover in this material. I mean, one of the hopes really is that universities, places like the University of Minnesota will have seminars where they can dig in deeper, um, have their students look at this, you know, to be, to be able to sort of bring the receipts to the university. I mean, if you want to talk uh, to the trustees, or if you want to talk uh, to the president, um, it can be really useful to sort of bring the facts out of your own archives, and they're there. Thank you for that. Someone does ask, do you see any um, future uh, work on this given, they ask specifically how COVID and potential future of remote work might support some land back, in, land back initiatives. Any ideas from any of you how that might work? Yeah, I'm not quite sure either, and except that, um, you know, the beauty of COVID, there's no beauty of COVID, the one uh, tiny sliver of, um, from COVID that we get of reprieve from COVID is that we're able to communicate more without having to travel. So less money going into all that uh, travel to and uh, make collaborations to hopefully, and particularly given that we know that not as much, there is not as much money existing within efforts for uh, native people. So maybe more of us are able to put our heads together through this virtual world and uh, make some of these efforts happen. Um, who has the, there's another question about the research on who is the largest purchaser? Um, well, I'll, I can I, I can answer that, but I also want to weigh in on the last question and, uh, okay. and if Pat or Doug have, a, um, have anything to have them uh, uh, jump in too. One of the unexpected things I mentioned earlier that this came out as sort of COVID was taking off and sort of the whole team working on this project was like, oh man, this might be the worst this might be the worst time in the century to uh, to put out a multi-year research project, um, but it was too late to hit the pause button. Everything had gone to press. Um, but in, I mean, I don't want to talk about COVID having uh, silver linings. Um, but one of the unexpected sort of turns in all this um, is I think there has been a growing awareness uh, or a willingness, especially among Americans. Uh, to grapple with um, the effects of structural racism and how it gets built in the systems uh, and how uh, the same sort of events can have, uh, can have differential impacts on different communities uh, based on, uh, based on uh, their, their material well-being. I mean, we see this in definitely in the field of health, 
Uh, and we see this also in the, in the field of education. Uh, and this is part of that story. Um, so I think a lot of people are sort of reading it through that lens um, and are uh, and are are primed to sort of uh, understand the way something like the Morrill Act uh, advantages some groups and disadvantages others. Thank you for that. I have from uh, David McMillan and Gunner. Um, I see a question. Uh, Gun Mr. Fram F R A H M has raised his hand, and I don't know. Kirsten, if you're able to allow anybody to speak or not. Otherwise, Mr. Fram, we might have to ask you to uh, um, type your question in. Um, I have a statement from our question from David McMillan. Professor Johnson pointed out some things happening in Minnesota before the university and the tribes in Minnesota since the research was published. Much remains to be done in Minnesota. As we look at those steps, are there examples of LGU uh, tribal work in other states that we should be aware of? And have you differentiated between land grant, land grab, endowment funds, and endowments that are unrelated? Many LGUs have both. And great work and great material. Thank you to the panel. So, Tad or uh, Mr. Lee or uh, uh, Professor Thompson, do you want to take that first one? I just wanted to comment. I did write to somebody that uh, they wanted to know which region was on. Actually, our our region from the eighth district, eighth congressional, just is. Uh, uh, David McMillan, who is a really good guy, and uh, and I'm not just sucking up to him. He really is. A, he takes a big interest in uh, Native American issues, and uh, uh, had been the board of chairman of the board of regents last year. Um, but um, I look at what Arizona is doing right now in um, everything from federal Indian law to, and Doug's actually a, a graduate of their. Uh, law program, but you know every um, the Southwest seemed to be doing a lot, and South Dakota State University. Somebody mentioned them; they're doing some unique things with regard to their land grant status. But I'll let Dr. Lee uh, respond. Um, yeah, there were two questions there. The first was on other examples. Um, one, I think, it's really important to take note of is the example of South Dakota State University. Um, and it's Wakini Initiative, uh, which began before, uh, before the work on, on this story. They're really ahead of the curve um, on this issue, funneling their, the, the proceeds that they received from the Morrill Act um, into, uh, into programming and uh, for indigenous students and a Native American student center um, that, they've, that they've built in the last, in the last couple of years, um, really thinking about how uh, resources from the Morrill Act can be redirected uh, for the benefit of, of, um, of Native American students. Um, we're seeing some other um, uh, approaches in, in, in other places, you know, Colorado thinking about uh, changing its, um, altering its, uh, its land acknowledgement or uh, at the University of California, when we had discussions about this, there's some thought about you know, what, what land back could look like in different models uh, in California. I mean, there are a lot of different ways to approach this. I think the, 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 the main or the, the, the crucial ingredient is what Tad was talking about earlier um, in, in his comments about opening up communication between uh, the nations that provided this resource for the universities and the universities themselves uh, to see what, um, what, what reconciliation can look like and what forms it could take. Um, the other question was about um, disaggregating the Morrill Act funds from other, from other funds or other land grant funds. Um, and the answer is, first of all, we did disaggregate them. Uh, but, uh, well, we didn't disaggregate them. We only researched the Morrill Act of 1862 funds. So our study was, was bounded by the Morrill Act of 1862 and its recipients. So the, the funds that I talked about when I was giving my, giving my remarks, those are all Morrill Act of 1862 funds. There are lots of other, there are lots of other land-based funds um, associated uh, with universities. Um, there are ones that provided uh, much more income as well, especially when you get into, into lands that can provide things like, like um, mineral rights and can be leased out uh, for mineral revenues. Um, this is particularly the case at the University of Minnesota. Um, so if you look at, uh, if you look at Minnesota's um, endowment and you look up the, uh, I think it's called the Permanent University Fund, um, 
that is an aggregation of, of, of many different uh, sources of land income, and it's worth many hundreds of, of millions of dollars. Um, and it is generated, uh, it has been generated primarily through, through, um, through mineral income. That's my understanding, but that wasn't within the purview. Uh, that wasn't within the purview of the story. It's one of these areas um, that needs a lot more, a lot more looking into. Thank you for that very complete answer. Make a quick comment, Mary. Yes. Um, so some of those funds were used uh, that I think Dr. Lee was referring to, to endow the um, uh, the ind chair in Indigenous Education in the education school at UMD. But I mean, there's a lot more that could be done with them. But I did want to say something positive about uh, the University of Minnesota. They um, uh, for the first time, um, the University of Minnesota president has, has met with the tribes of Minnesota and has committed to meet with them on a regular basis. Um, and we're just obtaining funding to, um, to jointly write, um, for the tribes to write their history of their dealings with the University of Minnesota uh, system and uh, for the university to work with them on that. So uh, Regent McMillan is correct, we are, Trying to trying to make take some steps, and I think creating this position that I currently hold, um, yeah, I got it from by complaining a lot, but um, we are we are starting to get a few things done. We're we're doing some, taking some some steps that we hope will be productive in the years to come. So, um, but the, a lot a lot of the tribes were very inspired by your writing, Doctor Lee. So thank you for that. Yeah, and, and to add to just really quickly to Robert and to to Tad. Um, I've been working with one tribal nation that's really um, embraced the power of history as painful as it is and understanding the history, how things are now based on what happened then and developing strategies on everything from having land restored, um, getting proceeds from management of public lands that were wrongfully taken away and even creating hiring, hiring preferences in areas where tribes have been impacted, not just the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but federal agencies as well. If you can tie those impacts to that agency action or that historic action that led to agency action that's still damaging today, um, there should be hiring preferences. And so knowing this history is very powerful. And, you know, it's, it's, it's important what, you know, Tad and others of us are doing with the University of Minnesota, but it's happening on all kinds of levels now. And it's just wonderful. Thank you for that. I agree, connecting it. Um, there are a couple comments on the Wokini Initiative. One um, comment in general, maybe it's working because the current president is an enrolled tribal member and another person um, suggested that we look at how indigenous people are actually receiving this project, always important. So um, we can see what the news says and then we ask what native people think. So thank you for those comments. There are a couple of specific ones, including one from Betty Green and someone else wanting to know specifically a little information about UMD rather than having to look it up on the website. And then also another professor, a pharmacy professor asked about University of Alaska Fairbanks is also a land grant university. Was UAF considered to be involved in this land grant grab enterprise? And if so, did it involve Alaska native? Land. So UMD, can you make a couple of comments on UMD, Professor Lee? Sure. Uh, oh, Professor oh, Johnson, right. please go ahead. Please go ahead, Todd. Yes. I, I thought you were throwing that to me, but sure. uh, to unless you. he's, unless, okay. Uh, I was just going to say we have um, the University of Minnesota, to its credit, had uh, among the first as a system in the Twin Cities, had the, among the first American Indian Studies departments in the country. Uh, UMD actually started theirs um, fairly early as well. We've added a number of programs, um, uh, two master's degrees, a master in tribal administration and governance, and a master of tribal resource and environmental stewardship. Um, we have um, um, American Indian Learning Resource Center, and um, um, uh, we've uh, increased the number of Native American uh, uh, students over the years, um, and that's I, I don't know if that's the type of answer they wanted, but um, uh, we are part of the land. Thank you. Did you have anything to add to that, Mr. Lee? Um, on, on Alaska, um, sort of close listeners to the uh, to my presentation earlier will recall that I said there were 47 states 
that receive these Morrill Act grants, which are the three that are omitted? Um, they are Oklahoma, they're Alaska, and Hawaii. Oklahoma and Alaska both have land grant universities that received land, uh, but it wasn't under the authority of the Morrill Act of 1862. And because of the sort of narrow bounds under which we constructed the study, um, we, we, left that, we left them out. These are other land grants that provided um, their land. The University of Hawaii um, received a cash land grant, a, land, a landless land grant. They, they received a cash endowment. Um, Alaska, interestingly, um, of course, the largest state receives the lowest uh, land through its, through its various land grants. You might have seen Senator uh, Murkowski in the news uh, recently discussing uh, uh, one, of her, one of her, I guess one of her planks of her program is to get to expand the University of Alaska's land grant by tapping into the, the sort of state's, uh, the state's um, endowment of lands through its enabling act. Uh, when, the, when the state was created. Um, this has long been an issue in, in Alaska. It's not one that I am uh, uh, deeply familiar with. Um, but yeah, there are, there are universities that are land grant universities without any, any land. Um, some with land like Alaska, some without land like, like Hawaii and also the tribal colleges. Thank you for that. Betty was asking, or uh, Ms. Green was asking specifically about specific lands connected to UMD. Um, the uh, specific lands connected to UMD. So these were uh, University of Minnesota um, uh, was, I mean, its main campus was the original campus and the beneficiary of the of the grant as far as far as I know. So they wouldn't have been um, they wouldn't have been allocated any to, to UMD. What the, there is a question, um, and because we only researched the principle that was raised. Um, there's still remaining research to be done into the long-term earnings of these funds. Uh, whether or not any of that ended up at UMD is an open question. We just don't know. Thank you. Um, Gunnar Fram, um, I apologize because I don't see all your questions. I know that you had it in here at one time, but I'm going to read what we have and see if the panelists can... Um, I, I think this is pretty clear. I'm curious to hear people's thought on how the Morrill Act seems to be acting contradictory to the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, which sets the president's republic precedence for public education, but at the same time is. And I'm sorry, I can't find the rest of that. Does that question make sense without the rest of it there? Mr. Lee. Does anybody recognize that? Uh, I'm I'm interested to I'm interested to hear the the contradictory uh, the contradictory twist. Um, it's right that the Northwest uh, the Northwest Ordinance um, envisions the distribution of land for public education, but uh, you know we're talking about primary level, high school level. This is still the case. It's much more land involved, um, and uh, I mean I would see the Morrill Act as a as an expansion of that. Um, into the realm of, of higher education, um, but uh, what is what is contradictory uh, about it? I would I would love to hear the the rest of the the rest of the question because it seems to be working on the same principles of expropriating indigenous land to fund uh, education for white Americans. Okay, thank you for that, and I apologize, Mr. Fram, that I can't pull all your question in there, but I think that uh, Mr. Lee still got to the point of it. All right, so this is an anonymous attendee asked, could the panelists say more about how we should talk about cessation? I think what I'm hearing is that we should talk more openly about coercion with regards to all of this ceded land. The current narrative sounds more like native people in the US government got together in a harmonious way and native nations ceded their lands almost in a non-pressured way. I'm feeling from this chat that we need to be more forceful about a different history and story. And I'm gonna start with you, Mr. Thompson or Professor Thompson. You want to take that your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I can start with that. So having worked for a federal agency for the past four years as a tribal liaison, it took um, probably six months into that job for people to realize that I was working for the benefit of the tribe because there is a trust responsibility that I had to educate these federal employees about. So that was painful step number one for them. Painful step number two was to teach them about privilege and history. And, um, and it helped to go right at it. It helped to go right at it because a lot of people just crossed over, said, you're right. 
and other people dug in and it created internally in this unit, this federal unit that had about 120 employees, it, it created a dialogue that continues today. And so I think just making it the unvarnished um, description of what happened is the way to go. I don't think you can play around with it. I don't think you can dress it up. Thank you, Professor Thompson. I think that uh, your point, um, it's uh, always a little bit difficult on all of these talks because there are so many different um, degrees of awareness. And as you said, there were several people who are very beginning stages. And so you have to deal with that before you can move on at all, even though other people might be getting bored of the conversation. It's always a little bit awkward. Um, any other thoughts, Professor Johnson or Lee, on that same question, coercion versus? I'll just say there's no, I mean, um, agreeing with the, with the question, there is no doubt that this is a form of conquest by law through which the treaties become and sort of the language of, of session uh, becomes a sort of the, the nicety that sort of tucks it into um, uh, tucks it into U.S. U.S. possession, um, and yeah, there's a variety of these uh, these means that are going on. Part of the part of the challenge is the sort of the, the complexity of, of it. There there are um, in this sort of 162 land takings um, that we identified behind the Morrill Act. Um, you have treaties that were signed. You have treaties that were never ratified. This is this case in California. You have outright seizures of, of land that are. Uh, and they don't even have the pretense of being bilateral in any way. Um, and this is happening in places like uh, places like Nevada, California, the Pacific Northwest. Um, yeah, uh, there is no doubt that this is co uh, coercion, uh, it's strong arming, there are lopsided power relations, and that's all baked into uh, baked into the sort of language uh, of treaties. Part of the part of the challenge, I think, is is, is hearing the word uh, session or hearing the word treaty. Um, and having it trigger uh, that complexity, um, which is, yeah, there's not a uh, easy solution to. Professor Johnson, anything to add to that? No, I, I think uh, it's been covered, so we can move on. Thank you. Um, I think a little bit of a rhetorical uh, comment um, more than anything outside, uh, else is outside of the studies, how much more research will be needed before the reality of turning land over to tribes and nations? And um, of course, that is a frustration that many of us are facing. We thought about that today. How much research do we need to show that um, racism is a form of a health or causes health disparities? Here's another one, though. Is there a connection? Um, I think you answered this, Mr. Lee. Is there a connection to LGUs and colleges that offer free tuition to Native people? But specifically, I, um, I don't think that I heard you mention Fort Lewis or Haskell. No, do you know about those two by any chance? Mm -hmm. That's all I've heard of you know. Uh, I do not know about uh, Fort Lewis or or Haskell, um, okay. and there are some. Um, I think there are. There, does Michigan maybe offer uh, free tuition to 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 students to um, to Native American students from within the state? Um, I don't think it's a. I don't think it's across the board. I mean, this is one of the major calls that have uh, that has come out of the response to the work, asking for free tuition. Uh, for, for Native students. Um, this is something that emerged in the most recent um, petition at Cornell. We've seen it at other places. We've seen it in policy briefs. Um, so it's by no means standard, but there may be instances of it um, that, uh, you know, I don't, have the, I don't have the full list at my fingertips. Thank you for that. Uh, it looks like we are starting to wind down on our questions. Um, there was there is one specifically. I was also wondering if you could comment on a similar act exists with the universities in Hawaii with crown lands. I think you did mention Hawaii, but I did you go much into the crown lands? No, I don't know anything. I don't know anything about the crown lands. Yeah, um, I would love to. I would love to find out if you if you if you have any place to have any place to look on that. Okay, thank you. I don't see a lot of other questions, so I would like to end with this one as we are approaching this holiday this um, week. And I would like to send this one to um, uh, Professors Thompson and um, Johnson. Wait, 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 who's there? Is there? Um, I think um, Ted might have got cut off, but he might be joining. I think okay. this happened a little bit earlier and I think he was able to rejoin, so. 
Okay, so we'll start with you, Professor Thompson. I'm wondering with the upcoming holiday on Thursday, what is the native perspective on Thanksgiving? What would you ask families to consider as they reflect on this Thanksgiving this year? And I want to preface this with um, all of our recognition that there are you know, 574 federally recognized tribes and many different ideas within each of those tribes and then all the tribes that are not, or tribal nations that are not recognized by the federal government. So given all that, Professor Thompson, you want to take that one? It's a common question too. You know, I think the what we've learned today with uh, Robert's presentation is the kind of thing we should be considering at Thanksgiving. You know, having a committing to having a full understanding um, as to why we're all here, the history going back to the doctrine of discovery, and um, you know, because this country was discovered when the the English or the British came here, to have that that understanding and and be respectful of the history and the pain that has occurred and the harm is I think key to celebrating Thanksgiving. If you're going to celebrate Thanksgiving, that's about the best answer I can give. And the history is different all over. Like I talked about one tribal nation that's um, standing up a social slash environmental justice program. The history is the same, but right there that this, this nation is going deep, deep into its history um to understand it because it's, it's different everywhere you go there's so many nuances even though a lot of things like boarding schools allotments happened you know across across the country um is uh professor johnson on here any longer kirsten i don't believe he's rejoined us yet no okay mr lee do you have any other thoughts on this oh i don't think i can top uh, uh doug's answer that, okay. might be a, that might be a great place to leave it. Um, I would like to uh, give my own answer as a Native American physician and thinking about this a lot. And I get asked, asked this question a lot as well. And um, that is, it's not, people assume that we don't want to uh, celebrate, but we do. We're very communal people in general. I always speak in generalities when I speak about Native people. I'm only one of many. And so it is a time of celebration to come together with our families. It's much more difficult this year. And thank you for pointing out there are no silver linings in COVID. I would totally agree with you, Professor Lee. And um, we are all suffering right now from not being able to come together the way we, we want to. I would ask that other people though, recognize that Thanksgiving is filled with the traditional narrative of Thanksgiving in this country is filled with stereotype. And this idea that we passively uh, gave away our land and shared it with um, with colonizers. When, if you read the history, you'll realize it was anything but that was anything but the case. So, just a reflection on history and how we can all demand a change in the narrative that is exists out there about Native people. Until we do that, I don't think we're going to start to really see huge changes in our lives and therefore in our economic system, our housing, and all these injustices, and therefore our health systems, and our disparities. With that, I want to thank our panel. Um, we do have more, a few more questions and we will grab those up and answer those offline. Um, we will uh, have uh, Professor Lee's um, uh, um, article, both the New York Times opinion piece and the actual original article along with um, Mr. Tristan, um, pardon me, Mr. Lee, what's Tristan's last name? Aton. Aton, thank you. Um, I think it's just because I'm on here. Um, uh, uh, article for you to look at as well as the website where you can find out the land that you are standing on. I also want to, um, before I forget, uh, do a call out and a mention of thank you about the comment about land grant universities recognizing not only where the land, uh, the land that you're standing on, but the monies to support the school that stands on the land that you're standing on is an extremely important point. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists. Um, Tad Johnson, Doug Thompson, and Robert Lee for this amazing talk and panel discussion that so much contributes to the health and welfare of Native peoples. And to wish you everyone here a happy holiday with your family as, and friends as much as you're able to be. And um, with that, we'll end the presentation. I will ask my panelists to stay on with me for a few seconds. Chi miigwech. Thanks so much. Thank you, audience.
All right. Sorry, I completely lost the internet there for, for <laughs> about the last yeah. five minutes. I'm sorry. It was a uh, um, the stand. It was the question about Thanksgiving and what should people should be thinking about. And Doug did a fantastic job answering. I think so. Oh, good. Um, no, uh, I, I have four people using the internet in this house, and <laughs> this guy's in London and he's fine. Um, but I'm I'm three blocks away from the university, and I'm. I'm <laughs> I can't get online. Uh, Are you Char back in town in Duluth? Yeah, I'm. I'm in Duluth. I 